No part of the following lecture material may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. I was Professor Rick Ramos and we're in Legal Aspects of Evidence Lecture 9 on Witness Privileges. So let's get down to it. What is a privilege for witnesses? A privilege is a statutory reason where a witness can legally refuse to testify in court. Privileges have traditionally been part of the rules of evidence. Some privileges have historical roots like the husband and wife privilege or the attorney client or clergy penitent privilege. Others were developed in response to the changing societal conditions like sexual assault or domestic violence, victim counselor cases, and the news shield privilege. The legal interest in protecting the privilege information takes precedent over the relevancy of the witness testimony and the testimony is never to be heard by the trier of fact. So the bottom line is, is that even though a witness might possess personal knowledge of facts being tried in the case, one can refuse to take the witness stand and have no negative inference taken for the failure to testify. The opposing counsel cannot bring it up as an issue to prove any facts or in any closing argument. There are two categories of privileges. Testimonial, which is the general privilege of a person to find in the evidence code refused to testify in court, and confidential communication, which is a qualified privilege defined in the evidence code related to oral or written disclosures made in confidence between persons in special relationships. So let's go over some of the rules regarding categories of privileges. First of all, the magistrate makes the final decision on whether or not the privilege can be claimed, and that is cited in 914 of the evidence code. Second, depending on the nature of the privilege, it can be waived by one or both of the parties that hold the privilege. If the privilege is waived, the testimony is heard by the trier of fact. If it's not waived, then obviously the trier of fact, which is the jury or the judge, doesn't hear it. Three, opposing counsel cannot comment on the exercise of the privilege, and no negative inference can be drawn from claiming the privilege. There can be no impeachment or consciousness of guilt argument, and a witness can't be held in contempt of court for claiming a privilege. Letting you know that I am recording today while I'm away at a conference, so you might hear a little bit of background noise, but it can't be helped. I just really want to get this information to you. So the first of the privileges that we're going to talk about is the privilege against self-incrimination, which comes directly from the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights. The privilege against self-incrimination provides that a criminal defendant has a testimonial privilege not to be called as a witness, not to testify against themselves. Also, any person has a testimonial privilege to refuse to disclose information which might incriminate themselves. You should also know that the uh, counsel for the defense can also assert the Fifth Amendment for their client when they need to. Now, while you have the right to take the Fifth Amendment, you should know that no defendant is allowed to tell the jury his or her story without subjecting themselves to the risk of perjury prosecution if they lie. They must answer questions designed to expose them as a liar. And this comes from William versus Berg in 1998. There are some exceptions to the self-incrimination privilege. The first is that if the defendant takes a witness stand and testifies in their own defense, the privilege against self-incrimination is waived. This means that the prosecutor can cross-examine them on any matter brought out during direct or redirected examination for the purposes of impeaching them, making showing that they're lying. Some examples. In the Reynolds case in 1984, if the defendant presents his theory of the case to the jury, they must permit the prosecutor to cross-examine them in order to, to amplify the facts and circumstances surrounding the assertions made by the defendant and attempt to refute the references of the testimony. Failure to answer the prosecutor's questions will result in the defendant's testimony being stricken from the record. In the Borg case, after a sex crime robbery kidnapped, the defendant testified on his own behalf. The prosecutor asked him a series of questions on cross-examination about seven prior convictions for similar offenses. The defendant def refused to answer these questions, and the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that a defendant testifying for himself, as with any other witness, is supposed to swear to tell the truth and then tell it on cross-examination, as well as direct examination. The second ex exception to the self-incrimination privilege is that prior to custodial interrogation, when a suspect voluntarily waives his or her privilege against self-incrimination, meaning that they've been read the Miranda rule and they've decided to make a statement, 
voluntarily and give an admission or a confession. The prosecution, though, carries the burden of proof to show that the admission or confession was legally obtained and the statements were, were, were not taken in violation of uh, the Fifth Amendment because then they would be subject to the exclusionary rule. The Thompson case in 1986, although the defendant is protected from being penalized for asserting their right to remain silent upon arrest, they're not shielded from making voluntary post-arrest statements and then insulate themselves about the statements by asserting the, the self-incrimination privilege. In other words, if the person is not in custody, then Miranda doesn't apply. And in that case, anything that they say can be used against them. The third exception is the privilege against self-incrimination doesn't apply to the seizure of physical evidence from the accused person or identification evidence. This exception includes the taking of fingerprints, prints, blood, hair, fibers, handwriting, and voice exemplars. Photographs or require the defendant to participate in lineups or show up, or even to say specific words like, this is a robbery. Next one is, this is a robbery. You know, the, what you're doing is you're trying to let the victim hear the voice inflection of the suspect to see if that's the, the person that robbed them. They can all be, also be required to stand in show-ups on what we would call curb side show-ups or perform chemical tests, performance tests, model certain articles of clothing. So when we talk about testimonial evidence, what we mean is speaking out against oneself in court. Examples in uh, California court. Schmerber versus California, 1966. Voluntary seizure of blood sample to determine whether the suspect is intoxicated while driving is not protected by the self-incrimination clause. In Gilbert in 1967, a compelled lineup, voice exemplar, and handwriting exemplar are not covered by the self-incrimination privilege because this evidence is non-testimonial. And this is in Wade and also Gilbert both in 1967 cases. The privilege against self-incrimination doesn't apply to refusing to reveal the location of an abused child, and a mother can be held in contempt of court for failure to produce her abused child or disclose her whereabouts. The societal interest in the governmental providing of care and custody of the child supersedes any witness privilege. This happened in a case in 1990 called Boyk Knight. Another example is <clears throat> Alvria, which says that during the ex examination of a robbery witness who had testified the suspect spoke with a lisp, the defendant was made to stand in front of the jury, demonstrate his missing tooth, and speak phrases he uttered during the commission of the crime. Prosecution then continued the witness examination without asking for voice identification. Because the words that the robber spoke would likely stand out in the juror's mind, the Ninth Circuit Court excluded that statement. And what you have to know, though, is you cannot... I've already told you that you can take blood from a DUI, but you can't take blood or any other chemical test from the person using a force that would shock the consciousness. In other words, if you needed blood from the DUI and the, the person wasn't going along with the program and you punched them in the nose and held a bucket underneath there to collect the blood, that would not be approved by the court. It would be excluded. So it's what's reasonable. I know that San Jose PD got in some trouble a few years ago because they used to have a 2x4 that an officer fashioned. It was a 2x4 and had these gnarly restraints on them that you would tie the person's hand down and then the nurse could come in and jab you with a needle. And they, they left that, that restraint device right near the back door of the ER room and officers would routinely strap it on the arm of a suspect because then they couldn't resist in, in uh, taking up blood, but they would have to fight with them to get that arm in there. And the court excluded and stopped that policy um, because they said that it was shocking to the consciousness. But to spin this around on the total other side of the argument, if you're asking for a writing exemplar, a chemical test, something that would clear an innocent person, then you could bring it up under consciousness of guilt in court, saying basically that the person has a guilty mind, and that's why they don't want to provide the evidence. An example would be when a person willfully tries to suppress evidence, especially that which tends to exonerate them, jury can be advised that the person has a consciousness of some sort of wrongdoing, and that comes out of the Canberra case in 1988. The next topic that we're going to start to discuss is the husband and wife privilege.
and it's based around a, a case in 1973 which basically states that the privilege afforded to married persons is based upon the consideration of public policy which seeks to preserve the confidence and tranquility of the marital relationship. And that's the whole basis behind the husband and wife privilege. So the purpose of the privilege is to promote harmony in the marriage and to allow the spouses to communicate openly and confidently with each other. Let's talk about the general pr privilege for a spouse to refuse to testify or to be called as a witness against their, their spouse. This is a cross-the-board privilege during ma marriage. Now, as the marriage dissolves, the privilege also dissolves. Be aware of that. The following examples can be used to claim the husband-wife testimonial privilege. Number one, one spouse witnesses the other spouse commit a crime. Now, it's interesting that if they're co-principals, then the spouse can claim the Fifth Amendment, right? Privilege against self-incrimination. The second rule is that if the wife finds some evidence that shows that the husband committed a crime or she overhears the admission of the spouse, then she can apply the privilege. The third rule is that if the confidential communication privilege was voided by it being overheard by a third party, the wife can still maintain the privilege and not testify against the... Uh... Now, the spouse, the person who's being called as a witness, is the only person that can claim the privilege. It belong, the, that right belongs solely to the witness spouse. The witness spouse can either assert the privilege or refuse to testify or waive the privilege and decide to testify. The other thing you need to know is that they have to be married at the time. If the marriage dissolves, the privilege also dissolves and the person could be called to the witness stand. Let's go over exceptions to the uh, husband and wife testimonial privilege. The first is that it applies only in the course of a valid marriage. So people who are domestic partners or common law marriage or anything that California doesn't recognize doesn't count. However, under the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution, a common law marriage legal in another state can be valid for the purposes of claiming the privilege when the parties subsequently reside in, reside in California. So if you qualified for a legal common law marriage in Alabama, that would be found to be valid in California for the purposes of the privilege. An example given by the author is that a couple who didn't qualify for common law marriage in Texas tried to claim the privilege, and because Texas wouldn't recognize that they were married, they couldn't make the claim that they were common law, so California did not recognize it either. The second exemption is that they have to be married to the person at the time the crime is committed. You can't claim a privilege on criminal activity that you had knowledge about before you were married to your spouse. The third exception is the one I spoke about earlier. The marriage legally terminates, so it's annulled, or, or the persons get divorced, then the privilege ends. There is also no testimonial privilege in crimes committed against a person or property of either spouse, a, a child, a parent or relative or cohabitant of the household or against a third party while committing a crime against the person or property of the other spouse. So this includes crimes such as cohabitational abuse, aggravated assault, spousal rape, child abuse, elderly abuse, child endangerment, non-supportive spouse child of or child bigamy, incest, or child molestation. This is why abused women are forced to testify against their husbands. That's the exception. In the McGraw case, a wife had knowledge that her husband's act of murdering his 22-year-old stepson. No privilege could be claimed. In Johnson, the defendant was charged with attempt murder after the severe beating of his second wife. During the assault, he admitted to killing his first wife. The victim's spouse testified against her husband. There's no marital privilege where one spouse is charged with committing a crime against the other spouse. An example of the third-party rule. The defendant falsely imprisoned his wife and her boyfriend. Then the boyfriend was forced into the vehicle trunk, shot, and killed. His spouse could be compelled to testify against him because the crime was committed against a third person during a continuous course of criminal conduct. So we just said that there are some exceptions to the husband and wife testimonial privilege. And what I want to talk about now is that you have a confidentiality communication privilege also that, that has to be addressed. This is a little bit different because unlike the husband and wife testimony privilege, 
the husband and wife confidential communication privilege lives on past the, the marriage. It belongs to both spouses. And even if one spouse wants to testify, the other can actually block that testimony resulting in a from a confidential communication. Now, they apply to any form of communication between spouses, including verbal, written, audio tape, videotape, signing, interpreting, body language, or actions, including pointing or nodding of the head. And this is written out in 225 of the Evidence Code. Example, a videotape depicting sex acts between husband and wife is a subject of a marital privilege. The next one is, an arsonist defendant told his wife about what he had done and how he had done it. And these revelations were uncovered as, communi as confidential communications. This is in Dorsey. The husband and wife confidential communication privilege applies even after a marriage has ended. As long as the confidential communication took place during the course of the legal marriage, the privilege can still be claimed by either ex-spouse after divorce or annulment. Conditions and exceptions to the husband and wife confidential communication privilege include that, again, the husband and wife have got to be married. So in a case where a fiancé and the defendant were writing letters to each other, they could not claim the privilege because they were not legally married. Similar, similar to the uh, husband and wife testimonial privilege, another exception is when the crimes are committed against a personal property of either the spouse or the children or the parents or the relative of the cohabitants or a third person while committing a crime against property or person of, an, of the other spouse, similar to the, the previous privilege. And the third exception to the rule is when the disclosure is made in the known presence of a third person without precautions to ensure confidentiality. So by sharing their intentions with three other persons, the defendant had no desire to keep a secret that comes out of the Gomez case. An example of this was the Gomez case in 1982 where the defendant made threats to his wife directed against her lover. These threats were also communicated on separate occasions to two students and to his mother-in-law. The defendant ended up killing the lover, and because of the revelations to the others outside the marriage relationship, the court ruled that the defendant's statements to his wife were not meant to be confidential, and so he could not claim it. The fourth rule or exception is that the confidential communication privilege cannot be extended outside the marital relationship to include the children or family, only the spouse. And the last is because there are two privileged categories that exist under husband and wife. If the confidentiality communication is voided for some reason, a testimonial privilege may still be claimed by the witness spouse under the original. The next privilege we're going to discuss is the attorney-client privilege. The definition of that is a confidential communications privilege related to the disclosures between the attorney and the client for the purposes of legal consultation and advice. A client has a privilege to refuse to disclose. An attorney can refuse to disclose, or the client can block dis the disclosure of a confidential communication between the two of them. There is no testimonial application of this privilege. It only covers communication between the two, the attorney and the client. If the attorney was to be a witness to a crime that the client was involved in, it would not be covered under this privilege. Here are the rules. First, a bona fide professional relationship is necessary. This means that the client has sought out counsel in a professional capacity for legal consultation, consultation or advice. They don't need to pay them any money. They don't need to even agree to take the case. As a matter of fact, in one case, the person sought initial consultation with the attorney, and they didn't retain that attorney, and the privilege was still maintained. If a client is assigned an attorney by the public defender's office, let's say Mr. Jones, to represent them during a physical lineup at a police department, and later on, and, and they have some conversations about the crime, and later on the defendant is assigned a second attorney, let's say Miss Smith, then Jones is still covered by the privilege. They can't speak about the case. They have to maintain confidentiality. On the other hand, if the defendant is talking to a jailhouse lawyer who's not really an attorney or licensed to practice law, as in the Velasquez case in 1987, then, then the privilege does not stand. Exceptions to the attorney-client privilege include when communications are made in the known presence 
of a disinterested third party. When attorneys interview their client, the jail officials have a duty to provide privacy for attorney-client conversations. An intentional eavesdropping upon or recording a professionally a professional confidential communication between attorney-client, physician, patient, or clergy confessor is a felony and results in the exclusion of evidence obtained under 636 PC. The privilege is meant to allow free exchange between the attorney-client without fear of these conversations being disclosed later in court. The next privilege we're going to talk about is a clergy confessor privilege. A clergy person, meaning a priest, can refuse to disclose or a confessor can block the disclosure of a confidential penitential communication made for the purposes of spiritual advice and absolution. So we know in the Catholic religion that Catholics go to church and they confess their sins. That information, if they were to confess to a murder or a rape or a theft, then the priest would not be able to testify against them in court and they could block the testimony. The next privilege is the doctor-patient privilege. With this privilege, a doctor can refuse to disclose or a patient can block the disclosure of a confidential communication made for the purpose of medical diagnosis and treatment. However, the doctor-patient privilege doesn't apply to criminal court testimony, so conversations about crime-related events void that privilege. The News Shield privilege is meant to allow a newspaper reporter or a news reporter to refuse to disclose the source of their information. This is under 1070 of the Evidence Code. The privilege does not disallow the testimony of a newspaper reporter if they witness an event. An event. A news reporter or news organization has the privilege to refuse, to refuse to disclose any unpublished information not released to the general public via the electronic or print media. A case that was an exception to the rule was in 1990 in Long Beach where the Los Angeles Times accompanied the Long Beach Police Task Force. And what basically happened was they witnessed and filmed a, a search and seizure incident, and later on they tried to take the privilege, saying they didn't want to disclose the information because it had to do with whether or not the Fourth Amendment was, was violated, and the court basically ruled that they had to testify. They witnessed the event, and information went to, right to the heart of the search and seizure issue. So again, remember, any published information released to the public through any media of communications, including written articles, notes, photographs, or videotapes, is legally subject to court subpoena, search warrant, or subsequent testimony in court. The last privilege I'm going to talk about is the fact that a police officer has the right to protect an informant. Under 1040 and 1041 of the Evidence Code, a peace officer has the testimonial privilege to refuse to disclose the identity of an informant who provided official information during the course and scope of the officer's duties. However, if this informant is a material witness on the issue of the innocence or guilt of the accused, then the defense is entitled to call that person before the court to be examined. If that is the case, and an officer still claims a privilege, she or he cannot be held in contempt of court, but the defendant is entitled to case dismissal on due process grounds. Now, how this usually happens is this. I had a couple of cases where I sent the informant in to buy narcotics, and that information was used to generate a search warrant. So the defendant was not testifying in the instant case. They were simply providing information which, which allowed me to get a search warrant. And then we served the search warrant, and we found drug evidence there, and we were prosecuting the defendant. The defendant claimed that the informant was a witness in the case and we had to go into an incorrect camera hearing where the presiding judge then listened to testimony of the informant in secret and made a determination that in fact the informant was not a witness to the case and therefore their testimony was not necessary. Well that's the end of this lecture. Make sure that you're checking the study questions at the end of the chapter and read your book. And uh, we'll see you next time. This is Professor Rick Ramos. Have a great day.